So we talked about how the heart conducts and how it pumps. Let's draw it out, just kind of review it. Hopefully remember the conductance pathway. It starts in your right atrium. You have a little node called the SA node. And that causes your atria to contract and it'll also send a signal to your ventricles via the AV node. And we see your AV node kind of slows things down, kind of gives it a pause, and we need that pause. But eventually it'll send the signal down to your ventricles via the bundle of hiss. Bundle of hiss. Right? And the bundle of hiss has its left branch and its right branch, which will connect to your Purkinje fibers. Purkinje fibers. And that will cause your ventricles to contract. That's what we said last video. Hopefully you remember that. And we said we can measure the health of this conducting system with a ECG, electrocardiogram. And your ECG kind of looks like this. And we label all the major events alphabetically. So it goes P, Q, R, S, T. Right? And initially your atria contract. Your atria contract, and that's measured in the P wave. Atria contract. And it'll send that signal down to your AV node, and there's a little pause, a delay. And we measure that via the PR interval. PR interval. So our AV delay. And we said it was usually less than 0.200 seconds. I, I think last video I said 0.20, but it's 0 0.200, okay? But once it gets to the AV node, eventually it'll send a signal down, cause your ventricles to contract. And that's measured via the QRS complex. So ventricular contraction, and also your atria will relax and repolarize at this time. All right, so your ventricles contract, 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 and then they relax, and that's your T wave. Ventricles relax, all right? And we said the time it takes from your ventricles to contract to re and to relax is your ST segment. ST segment. ST segment. That's what we went over last video. All right, so it's just some review of how your heart beats and how it conducts. If something's wrong with how it beats and conducts, we call that an arrhythmia. Arrhythmia. Literally meaning bad rhythm, right? This is a bad rhythm. It's not contracting the way it wants to. And there are many things that can cause it. Some people just have arrhythmias normally, and sometimes it's asymptomatic. Some people get it from medications. Some people get it from when they have some sort of heart disease. Yeah, if your heart cells die or they're injured, they can't really maintain their cell membrane potential. And so they get really, really unstable. I mean, they're already kind of unstable, but now they get even more unstable and they can have these arrhythmias. So there are many causes. I don't think you need to you know, really focus on memorizing all the causes, but just know arrhythmias exist. And we can categorize the different types of arrhythmias by kind of looking at the conductance pathway. So we said initially your atria will contract. So if there's something wrong with your atria, if your atria are acting kind of wonky, we call this, these arrhythmias, supraventricular. Literally meaning above the ventricles, because your atria sit above the ventricles. But if they're normal, they'll send that pathway or that conductance down to your AV node. Your AV node. If something's wrong with your AV node, if there's a block here, we call that AV block, aka heart block. That makes sense because it's kind of like this, it's kind of like the gatekeeper. The AV node is kind of like the gatekeeper. But if your AV node is normal, then it'll eventually send that signal down to your ventricles and your ventricles will contract. If something's wrong with your ventricles, you get our last category, which is ventricular arrhythmias. So a logical way to kind of break down arrhythmias, something wrong above your ventricles, we call that supraventricular, something wrong with your AV node, a little blockage there, we call that a AV block, something wrong with your ventricles itself, we call that a ventricular arrhythmia. So a very logical way to break down arrhythmias. So let's talk about arrhythmias that arise from your atria, supraventricular arrhythmias. You, have, you can have something called atrial fibrillation or AFib. Fibrillation means kind of moving without coordination. It's not contracting regularly. It's not contracting and pushing blood regularly. It's kind of just vibrating there. Kind of just vibrating there. So I'll write vibrating irregularly. They love to say it's, the heartbeat is irregularly irregular. 
So sometimes it'll vibrate really fast, sometimes it'll vibrate really slow, fast, slow, medium pace. So it just kind of goes without coordination. It's kind of just vibrating. So irregularly, irregular. And that's not good because if it can't fully contract, it can't fully pump blood into your ventricles. So blood kind of pulls there, there's stasis there, and you can form blood clots, all right, blood clots. And if that blood clot eventually makes it to your ventricle and you pump it out, it can go anywhere in your body. It can cause strokes, it can cause clots anywhere. So it's very, very bad, all right, strokes. They love to test this fact because it's quite dangerous as you can imagine. Now, how will it show up on ECG? Well, what measures your atria contracting? Isn't that your P wave? If it's not contracting the way it should, if it's just kind of vibrating, then you're not gonna get these nice little P waves, these nice clear P waves. Instead, you're gonna get something that looks kind of like this. Yeah, it just kind of vibrates, kind of like this. So, what do I wanna say? What do I wanna say? A very vibrating P wave. Okay, a good picture will be in my notes. Good picture will be in my notes. They love atrial fibrillation, and there are many ways um, they ask it. They'll talk about someone that's young. You see an ECG and you see this, and they say, what is the patient at risk for? Things like stroke, things like blood clots. Or maybe they already had a stroke, right? And then they ask what you want to do. You want anticoagulant because they're at risk for increased blood clots. Or they might say, if you feel their pulse, what does it feel like? It feels irregularly irregular. So many different ways they can ask this, but if you know these like three key facts, I think you'll be golden. All right, so that's AFib. The second one is called atrial flutter, flutter. Here, you are contracting, which is good. You're just contracting really, really fast. So you are contracting, you are gonna see those clear P waves. You're just contracting them really, really, really fast. Even faster than your ventricles, all right? So very, very fast contraction, all right, fast contractions. All right, so hopefully you can see the difference. These are, you can actually see the clear P waves. Again, a good picture will be in my notes. So fast contractions, fast P waves. Fast P waves. And there are a couple of mechanisms of why. Sometimes you can have abnormal fibers that carry your conductance back up to the atria. So instead of going down, it goes back up. We call that re-entry. You're kind of re-entering. And because you're re-entry, re-entry, that's not right. Because you're re-entering, you're kind of just kind of keep conducting and keep contracting, contracting, contracting. You contract really fast. You can contract really fast. The good thing is that the signals that do make it down to the AV node get slowed down. Your AV node is like the gatekeeper. It's not gonna allow all those fast contractions to go down because it can only allow so much at a time. It slows things down. So if you contract 300 times in your atria, it'll only allow 150 to go down to your ventricles, all right? It's a gatekeeper. Usually allows a two-one ratio. So like I said, if your atria contract 300 times, usually your ventricles will only contract 150. Yeah, thanks to our good old friend, the AV node. That's atrial flutter. Our last one is Wolf Parkinson White. Wolf Parkinson White. Wolf Parkinson White can have this re-entry. It can also, it can also have this bundle that leaves and actually connects directly to the Purkinje fiber, fiber, and that's not good. That means it bypasses our gatekeeper. That means it bypasses our gatekeeper, and therefore it's not controlled. It's not controlled. Your atria and ventricles are both contracting really fast now. So it can bypass via this bundle of fibers called the bundle of Kent. Bundle of Kent. When we were talking about our ECG, what did we say showed um, the slowing, the AV node slowing things down? We said that was your PR interval, right? And then what did we say showed your ventricles contracting? That was your QRS complex. So here is bypassing your AV node, your slowing, and it's causing ventricles to contract immediately. So it's bypassing this. So you actually get this premature contraction. 
you don't have that slowing down because you're bypassing your AV node completely. So you have this premature contraction. And we call this a delta wave. Delta wave. We call it a delta wave. That is very, very important. I've seen this asked probably two, three times in my career. And they will zoom in to an ECG, literally zoom into this wave and say, what? what's going on? It's Wolf Parkinson wave. Usually due to the bundle of Kent or some sort of re-entry pathway, okay? So that's Wolf Parkinson wave, delta wave. Very, very important. Yeah. Let me just reset this because we're gonna be using this a lot. That's super ventricular. Let's talk about AV heart block. AV heart block. We say AV heart block is when you send the signal down to your AV node and there's some sort of delay, some sort of blockage there. Some sort of blockage there. And it's separated in different degrees. First degree, first degree is just a slowing of the signal, a slowing of the signal. What do we say in the ECG shows that AV delay? That's your PR interval, right? So if you slow that, make the delay even further or even more, then you have a prolonged PR interval. You have a prolonged PR interval. So, all right. Delay it equals increased PR interval, which is more than our 0.200 seconds. And that's exactly what you see. That's exactly what you see. So you have a really, really, really long PR interval. Really, really long PR interval. Everything else is the same, just a really long PR interval. You can have a second degree heart block. And this is broken into two categories. You can have second degree type one. And this is basically a progressive delay, a progressive delay. The delay gets longer and longer and longer until one signal doesn't actually make it through at all. One signal doesn't actually make it through at all. Let me see if I can draw it. The delay will get longer and longer and longer until one signal doesn't make it out at all. Okay, so all right, progressive delay until beat is dropped. Until beat is dropped. These are all things you need to be able to recognize on the ECG. So, so again, look at my pictures in my notes really, really, really well. Maybe you put them on flashcards because you need to be able to recognize these on ECG. You can have second degree type two, type two. And this is when a signal doesn't go through. So you get a spontaneous dropping. So see if I can draw it again. Everything's looking fine, everything's looking fine, and suddenly you get a spontaneous dropping. And then it goes back to normal. Everything's looking fine, everything's looking fine, and then you get a spontaneous drop. So you're spontaneously getting a blockage there. No rhyme or reason, you just get a spontaneous block. So spontaneous drop. Yeah, you don't send a signal to your ventricles, your ventricles won't contract. You won't get that QRS complex. And then lastly, our third degree heart block is when your signal is so messed up, there is no communication at all. Your atria are contracting your P waves, your ventricles are contracting your QRS, but there's no relation. They're not communicating, they're not talking. So your waves are just basically contracting out of order. You might have two P waves every QRS, or you might have four QRS every five P waves. It doesn't really matter, you're not talking. So no communication. It just looks like mayhem. All right. One cause of third degree heart block that they really want you to know is Lyme disease. Lyme disease. Tick-borne illness. Do you remember what spirochete causes it? Pause the video, tell me what spirochete. If you haven't done micro, that's fine. Just flag this video and come back to it. Um, Lyme disease, really, really late stage, can affect your brain, can affect your heart. Cause that third degree heart block. They like that a lot, All right? So that's AV heart block. We said our third category of arrhythmias. Kind of erased it, but hopefully you remember, were your ventricular arrhythmias, your ventricular arrhythmias, ventricular. Your ventricular arrhythmias. You can have ventricular tachycardia or VTAC. That literally means increased ventricles contracting, 
contracting really, really fast. What on our ECG showed ventricles contracting? Your QRS complex, right? And so you literally have QRS complexes all over the stinking place. All over the stinking place. Lots of QRS. That's it, okay? That's all you need to know for that. Ventricular fibrillation is our next one. Uh, very similar to atrial fibrillation where it doesn't really contract, it just kind of vibrates. Just kind of vibrates. And so instead of just seeing this nice QRS contraction, you just see this QRS vibration. It's kind of QRS vibration. It's all over the place. It's all over the place. You need to know that V-fib is by far the most deadly. Anyone that goes into V-fib is halfway to heaven's door. All right, so you don't do antiarrhythmic drugs. You put on a defibrillator immediately and try and get them out of that because they're, they're basically about to die. So most deadly, most deadly. And that is actually all I wanna talk about for this. Now there are some miscellaneous arrhythmias that don't really fit in these categories. There's always something like that in medicine, right? There, it's, never, it's never that simple. So let's just talk about those really quickly. Let's just talk about that really quickly. You can have something called the long QT syndrome. Now what the heck is a QT? It's kind of like your ST segment where it measures the time it takes from your ventricles to contract to where it relaxes, your T wave. But it starts all the way in the beginning. Literally the first sign of ventricular contraction. So instead of a ST, you just start a little bit further. We call it a QT, all right? So if you have a long QT, if you have a long QT, that means it's taking a long time for your ventricles to contract and relax. And you can imagine that's not gonna be very good. Yeah, if you take a long time and your ventricles are contracting and you're like, come on, relax, 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 relax. Ugh, that's not good. So that is basically a long QT. It's a long time for ventricles to contract and relax. And there are many things that can cause this. You can be born with it, you can have um, medication causes. Uh, they really like to talk about the genetic causes. Genetic causes, often due to an ion channel defect. I mean, the whole heart conductance is due to ion channels. So if you have a defect in there, you can imagine it can affect your heart conductance. There are some syndromes. There are some syndromes. There's Romano syndrome, which causes long QT and deafness. There's something called Dravel syndrome, which is the same thing, but no deafness. There's something called Brugada syndrome. Brugada. And that's seen more in young Asian males and has a high chance of causing really, really bad arrhythmias and sudden death. So these people, sorry, Asian males, these people need an implantable defibrillator that automatically detects if there's a bad arrhythmia and will defibrillate them. Um, so they don't have to wait for someone to come in with a defibrillator kit. So you have to put in an implantable defibrillator, okay? Because they're at a high risk of death. All the times I've ever seen this ass, so I'll give you a little step secret. All the time I've ever seen this ass was when someone was swimming and then suddenly they drowned, right? They dropped dead and drowned because they had that arrhythmia and it's their heart seized and they drowned, all right? So sudden death in young people, um, you're thinking of something wrong with the heart. It could be a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which we'll talk about in a second or in subsequent videos, but it can also be these arrhythmias, all right? So just kind of keep that in mind. If you prolong your QT, if you prolong this QT and make this really long, you can prolong it to such a point where it no longer looks like this nice little spike. It starts to look like a sine wave. It starts to look like a sine wave, and that we call torsades. That we call torsades. It's all right, long QT. This actually looks a lot like ventricular fibrillation that we talked about just a minute ago, right? And then we say that was the most dangerous, and you can imagine torsades can actually progress to V-fib, so this is not a good thing. This is not a good thing. It's very, very dangerous. How do you treat it? You give them magnesium. They love this one. They'll show you this classic picture of 
torso size. Let's talk about long QT, and then ask you how you want to treat it. Give them magnesium. Magnesium, um, I don't know if I want to get into it right now, but magnesium blocks calcium, and that can affect your ions to a point where you can get out of torso size, okay? Get out of torso size. If magnesium is a treatment, then some causes will include low magnesium. So some causes from low magnesium. Those are your arrhythmias. Now our last topic is gonna be on antiarrhythmias. 